And we are live. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we will be discussing the most recent pullback in the markets. I accurately predicted this a few days ago. I started seeing things in the market that just absolutely made me say that it's time to pause a little bit. And then today we had the 10-year treasury start to spike. And when they say spike, it spiked to 1.36%. And then the market started to sell off. The stock market sold off. And the um, crypto markets began to sell off as well. And what you have to understand is crashes happen all the time in crypto. This is a relatively new asset class. The asset class is only worth $1.7 trillion, probably a little bit lower today. So it doesn't take a lot of money to push these markets around. And it's important that we keep things in the proper context. The market is up well over 400% in the case of Bitcoin. When you look at other altcoins, some of these coins are up 2,000%, 1,000%. So if we get a 30 or 40% correction, it's not the end of the world. This is just what is necessary to shake out weak hands or shake out what people would consider, you know, to be dumb money or new money. This is why I'm a huge proponent of dollar cost averaging, meaning that you should buy a little bit over time. Now, when we start talking about the macro theme that's happening right now in the economy, on one end of the spectrum, you have Janet Yellen and Jerome Powell saying that the market's overheated and that they fear that the monetary policy that they're embarking on is fueling an asset bubble. And we know this is true when you just look at the fact of they've injected trillions of dollars into the stock market via the repo market, via different lending facilities. So if anything's a bubble, it's the stock market. And the minute that the Fed tries to raise interest rates or remove that stimulus from the stock market, the stock market begins to go down. So on one end, they're signaling that they may begin to start tightening or raising rates. But just a few months ago, they announced that rates would remain at zero or lower for the foreseeable future up into the year 2023, 2024. So we know that the Fed will not raise rates in the short term. And when we look at the Treasury, the 10-year Treasury yield spiking to 1.36%, and I mean, it's laughable to even think that that's a spike. When you even put that into its proper context, the overall trend for the 10-year yield has been lower if you go back over the past decade and beyond. And I'm pretty sure the Fed is going to either use quantitative easing or some tapering uh, program or facility that they would put together to eventually start buying treasuries and push the yield back down. Because look what they're saying right here. The market is frothy, but they're pushing for more stimulus. So right now they're working on a $1.9 trillion stimulus package. And then now they're talking about a $3 trillion bill that they want to push through for infrastructure. Where do you think that money is going to come from? That money is going to come from either deficit spending or it's going to be printed into existence out of thin air. So it's very simple. This is how I can look out and project into the future what's to come because I understand it's very simple. If they do not inflate and devalue the dollar, the economy will tank. Pensions will become pension, basically pension funds. They will not have enough money to pay out the people who are supposed to be receiving them. When you look at real estate prices, they will crash. Uh, the economy will basically literally crash and burn if they do not print trillions of dollars and literally bail out the economy. So this is why it will be more of the same. You cannot be emotional and get caught up in the day-to-day -day fluctuations. You have to be smart and understand what the long-term trend is. See, I can cash out, you know, 80% of my altcoin portfolio 
and buy back in 40% lower because I still have a core position of, you know, Ethereum and Bitcoin and uh, Chainlink and GRT and so many other projects. So I can cash out of a chain if I want to and just sit in a staple coin. Now, for some of you who may not be sophisticated enough to do that, it's okay to just dollar cost average and not really worry about it over the long run because we're going to look at a history of Bitcoin crashes. And in most instances, you would have been better off just simply buying the dip. Uh, I see a donation. I saw a donation just come through uh, from JS Facts. I believe in God, Christ, Mom, Pops, and Elijah. You stated the stock market needed to reset due to all of the mess going on in it. So you was taking profit. So did I. And I brought some sales this morning. Congratulations. Yeah. And understand that what I'm saying is not financial advice. I'm not trying to sit up here and say that I'm a genius or anything like that. It's just I have a lot of experience with doing this. I've been doing I've been an entrepreneur now. But we're going on 12, 13 years now. I've been involved in crypto since late 2012, 2013. So I have a lot of experience with, you know, the market getting overheated and the market pulling back. And the difference between, you know, the stock market and the crypto market is that it's so easy to manipulate and push these markets around because we don't have a lot of infrastructure in place that you have in a stock market with circuit breakers and things like with Robin Hood, how they can restrict what you can buy and stuff like that. Crypto is sort of the wild, wild west. So like today there was a circuit breaker. I mean, not a circuit breaker, a flash crash, excuse me, that happened with Kraken where Ethereum crashed all the way down to $700 and back up. So like if you had limit orders at like $750 or $850, you could have scooped up some Ethereum for $850. A flash crash basically means that too many sell orders came uh, came through the order, hit the order book at one time, and the price just literally tanked 50%. And then within a matter of seconds, it went right back up to $1,500. So things like this happens all the time. And just to show you uh, what I'm talking about, um, right here, uh, three days ago, I posted this in my community section on my YouTube channel, and I said full transparency. As of today, I have sold 80% of my altcoin positions. I'm only 60% invested in Bitcoin, Ethereum, Polkadot, Chainlink, and GRT. After seeing Binance launch this latest scheme where they are literally copying Ethereum-based dApps code and tooling, this isn't innovation. Instead, this appears to be a scheme to lure newbies in with lower fees and new coins that will 10x. Yes, the market can and probably will continue to pump from here, but I've made my gains at this point. It's time for me to start being defensive. Historically, I mean, history doesn't repeat itself, but it damn sure rhymes. We all saw this happen in 2018. The purpose of Crypto is decentralization and to get rid of middlemen. Yet, everyone only seems to be concerned about pumping their bags. As always, this is not financial advice. Proceed at your own risk. Again, I'm not sitting up here trying to say that uh, I I always get it right, but I have enough experience to know that when I have newbies telling me that Cardano is better than Ethereum, First of all, it's, it's disrespectful to all of the developers who have, they've put their heart and soul into building these applications on Ethereum, to building the tooling around Ethereum, the infrastructure around Ethereum, to have a ghost chain like Cardano, who they've, they've accomplished nothing yet. They're literally about to finally launch on March 1st to sit up here and say that somehow Cardano is an Ethereum killer yet they don't even have a dap built on top of their main net that is anywhere near as competitive as an Aave, right? Or Uniswap. It's disrespectful. The reason why fees are cheap on Cardano is because no one's using it. It's a ghost chain. And I promise you, the reason why the fees are high on the Ethereum blockchain is because of the demand for Ethereum-based dapps, because of yield farming, because of staking, because of NFTs, because of all of the smart contracts and the complexity, that's why the fees are high on Ethereum. Not because Ethereum is just expensive, because of supply and demand. And there's demand for the Ethereum dApps in the ecosystem. There's no demand for Cardano. That's why it's cheap. 
So when you buy it, the reason why you don't pay any fees to uh, that's comparable to the fees that you're paying with ETH is because ETH is popular, right? This isn't complicated, but you know, you have people who they just parrot and repeat other things that they've heard someone else say. And Charles is really good at communicating and motivating you. Now, I'm not saying that Cardano will not go on to be a successful project. I'm not calling it a scam. What I'm saying is that it's very easy for me to sit up here and say that I can box with Mike Tyson. It's very easy for me to sit up here and say that I can play basketball and compete with LeBron James. And two, I get in the ring with Mike Tyson and he throws a haymaker at me and he hits me. See, it's very easy to say what you can do, how many transactions your blockchain can process, what the throughput is, right? What the fee structure and the fee base will be when no one's using it. But understand, March 1st is the time to put up or shut up. Because I was a big, I was a big investor in Cardano at one point. And then I got tired of all of the delays and the setbacks. So, you know, it's... It, again, as I said before, I'm not I'm not saying these things because I'm trying to talk down the project. Just be realistic and and understand what you're talking about, right? It, it's very easy to talk about how how robust your blockchain is. Ethereum is doing it, right? This is not theory. We're not talking about in the ether. Ethereum right now today, right on top of that blockchain. Just in the smart contracts alone, there's about $25 billion locked into DeFi. Real world money, real world utility. So when I see Binance trying to copy Ethereum, I say to myself, okay, there's a problem because many of you are new and all you care about is your bags pumping. So this is why I decided to just sit back and take profit. And, you know, rightfully so, that ended up happening. So again, who you listen to and what communities you are a part of will determine how much money you make and how much money you lose. A lot of people inside of my Slack group, I believe Alice was even talking and speaking about this and asking, you know, how do you take profit? So when I take profit, I simply just roll my profits into a stable coin. So I'll roll it into USDC or into the DAI stable coin and I'll sit there wait for the market to come down and then I'll go into the market and I'll stop buying um, the, the projects that I'm interested in. I'm really interested in the polka dot ecosystem and that's where I'm going to start focusing a lot of my resources. So uh, please do me a favor and uh, like this video, share this video, subscribe, hit the notification bell as you come in. Uh, make sure that you set it to all so that you can receive all of my notifications in the description below. There will be a link to my um, mailing list. Make sure that you click the link and join my mailing list so that you can be notified via email when I go live in case YouTube doesn't notify you. Also, a link to my Instagram page is in the description below. You can follow me on Instagram and shoot me a direct message. If you're interested in, number one, learning about this technology so that you can be self-sufficient and not have to follow what I'm saying or other people are saying, I put together my tech academy. We currently have a three day free trial. You are welcome to come and try it out. Please make sure that you cancel it before the three days are up so that you are not billed if you do not like the product and the service. If you would like to book a consultation with me and discuss business and discuss investing, you can come to my website as well and you can book a consultation with me. Um, it's beautiful to see a lot of you in the Slack group that we have. Uh, some of you are so advanced that I had to actually create a newbie channel for you guys because some of you are just, you're picking up on the information that I've been teaching you. And some of you are getting to the point now where you can, you could probably teach your own classes. And that's a beautiful thing, right? The Academy wasn't created because I just want to charge you every month. I put together the Academy so that you can learn about this technology in a safe and efficient way, and then go on and start doing your own thing. Right. I don't want I don't want to keep you in the academy forever. Right. After three or four months, you can cancel your membership and go about your business. Uh, many of you are, you know, as I said before, you're asking some really thought provoking questions to the point where I had to create a whole another Slack channel for the newbies. And that's a beautiful thing. Like you have people like Mr. G. He's running his own node. Um, he's shorting uh, Ethereum. That's the type of stuff that I like to see. I like to see people 
just getting engaged and and doing different things and that's the the beautiful thing about this so um obviously i see some donations coming through so you definitely can see and hear me clearly so let's sit up let's get to some of the charts and look at what's going on so this right here is a chart of the 10-year treasury and basically the 10-year treasury simply it starts to signal to investors if the economy is beginning to overheat right so the philosophy behind this is that we are going to get stimulus we're going to get a vaccine the economy is going to be robust inflation is going to start to creep up so you're starting to see the interest rate on the 10-year treasury start to go up and you're hearing everyone on wall street because that's one thing about the financial news that you have to understand is that they parrot and repeat the same thing and they keep you caught up in the emotional state and you're not really looking at things from a logical perspective so when you hear that the 10-year treasury spiked up the 10-year treasury basically is the benchmark that sets the cost of money right uh, interest rate basically tells you whether or not money is expensive or if money is cheap a 1.36 percent interest rate isn't that much isn't that serious of an interest rate but when you look at this if you looked at this chart and you simply looked at it since april you would say wow the rates are starting to go up but if you actually zoom out on the chart and you go back which we're going to do right now look at this right if we go back to 2018 the interest rate was 3.2 percent on the 10-year if we go a little bit further out right we go all the way up here to 2010 it was four percent if we go out further 2007 the interest rate was five and if we go all the way back here to 2000 the interest rate on a 10-year was almost seven percent why am i showing you this if you look at this chart what do you think the long-term trend of the 10-year is the trend is lower we are going to have negative interest rates we already see negative interest rates in europe the ECB is calling for negative interest rates. So when you're smart enough to take a step back and really look at this for what it is, you can see that interest rates are going to go lower in the long term. So now technology stocks, what happens is when you see the 10 years start to spike, investors start to sell technology stocks. Why? Because technology stocks are all based upon growth and into the future. And this is signaling basically that interest rates and the cost of money is will go up. But again, 1.36% isn't a steep interest rate. So when you when you see this, this knee-jerk reaction and you see everyone in the financial news media talking about, oh my God, rates spiked up, the long-term trend will be lower. We know that. This is not complicated if you just simply look at it for what it's going to be. And then as I said before, the only way out of the crisis that we're in right now is more stimulus, is more money printing. That's it. Either you let the economy crash and burn or you continue to keep printing money. And we're going to read a little bit of this right here where it says Yellen and Powell weary of financial froth while they push stimulus. So you can't have it both ways. The Fed is the creator of income inequality. It's not capitalism. It's not corporate greed. The Fed will not allow the market to crash. The Fed will not allow zombie companies to go bankrupt. The Fed constantly keeps intervening in capital markets and picking winners and losers. And they're not going to stop doing it. And I'm going to play Janet Yellen's words where, think about it, we're well over, what, 20 plus trillion dollars in national debt. When you start factoring in unfunded liabilities, you can go as north of I've seen some estimates as high as, you know, $70 trillion, some $100 trillion. I mean, when you think about these numbers, you, you throw around $50 trillion, $60 trillion, $70 trillion, that's a lot of money. That money will never be paid back in our lifetimes. It just won't be. So when you see them talking about, you know, well, we're going to raise taxes, you're going to have to do more than just raise taxes on the rich in order to make up those gaps so let's read this article real quick just a few paragraphs and then i want to get into some of the videos that jenny yellen put out so it says yellen and powell weary of financial froth while they push stimulus 
U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell appear weary of signs of froth in financial markets, even as they press ahead with economic stimulus measures that are elevating the euphoria. There may be sectors where we should be careful, Yellen told CNBC television last week, when asked about possible speculative sizzle. The remarks came a day after publication of minutes of the Fed's January 26-27 policy meeting at which staff characterized the risks to financial stability as notable, an assessment Powell shares according to a central bank official familiar with the matter. The policymakers face a difficult dilemma. While they recognize that ultra-lax economic policies can fuel financial excess, they believe the pandemic-damaged economy is in a deep hole and in need of substantial help. What does that translate to you and I? They're going to print a lot of money. What happens when you print money? It, press, it pushes asset prices higher. This ties into the Cantillon effect. Those the closest to the money printer, they get to spend the inflation first. What do you think happens when CEOs and executives receive bailouts and stimulus? They don't take that money and pay you a higher wage. They don't take that money and give you a better retirement package. Instead, what they do is they take that money and they either buy back their stock because buying back your stock makes it easier to push your stock price higher or they pay out record bonuses, right? But what they do not do is they do not take that inflation and use it for CapEx expended, uh, expenditures where they actually are going to help their employees. So this is why asset prices continue to keep going up. So when people talk about, well, where's the inflation? The way that the Fed calculates inflation is extremely problematic because what the Fed will say is, well, you know, they'll factor in a Netflix subscription, but you can't eat a Netflix subscription. So they'll say, well, Netflix is, you know, $14. So therefore inflation's low, but all of the things that you use on a daily basis, they don't factor that into inflation, right? Like energy and food, right? You cannot eat a Netflix subscription. So when you look at how they even calculate and, and, come up with the inflation numbers, it's extremely problematic. And it's basically, it's fake. They, they use hedonic measures and different measures to manipulate the actual data that they give you. And what happens is when they print this money, it's going to go into the stock market and push prices higher, which is why I laugh when I hear people say to me that, you know, crypto's a bubble. If crypto's a bubble, what is the stock market? What is the valuation of all of these companies? Some of these companies should be bankrupt. They shouldn't even exist. Look at the airlines and look at some of the, um, the, the cruise lines. A lot of those stocks should be bankrupt. They shouldn't even exist right now. So it says both have recently suggested that the true unemployment rate is close to 10% after taking account of those who have dropped out of the workforce or are involuntarily working part-time compared with the official figure of 6.3%. Compounding this quandary, the U.S. has fewer regulatory tools to head off asset bubbles and excessive leverage than many other countries. They, there's nothing they can do. It says Yellen spoke out in favor of President Joe Biden's $1.9 trillion fiscal aid package on Monday, telling a New York Times webinar that the spending was needed to prevent long-term scarring of the economy from the pandemic. Powell, for his part, is expected to reaffirm his commitment to the ultra easy policy when he testifies to the Senate Banking Committee on Tuesday. This is Orwellian. This is doublespeak on one end. And this is why I encourage you, if you're in the academy, you know, I always talk about these books to go and read George Orwell's 1984, because on one end, they're telling you that they're worried about a bubble. Mind you, they've been blowing this bubble for the past 10 years, right? But then on the other end, they're saying the economy's good, but we need more stimulus. Which one is it, right? Does debt, does the debt and deficits matter or they don't matter? And then all around the world, you have the rest of the world calling for a new Bretton Woods, calling for a new reserve set, a new reserve currency. And this is where digital currencies come into play. And this is where Bitcoin comes into play. And if you start focusing on the Great Reset, and the fourth industrial revolution, all of these things tie in. So when I make these predictions, I'm not making these predictions because I'm just pulling them out of thin air. 
we can see that there's a problem with debt and leverage in the system. We can see that there's a problem with the velocity of money. We can see that when money is printed, the inflation doesn't make it to you until the corporations have basically been able to use it. So clearly, there's a problem with our monetary system, which is why we need a new monetary system. And this is where the whole idea of a central bank digital currency comes into play. And we're going to get into Janet Yellen's words real quick. So um, which one do I want to play first? Well, right here, we can talk about Bitcoin, right? Because she speaks about Bitcoin here. And I, 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 want to, I want to speak about this. Let me turn this up so you can hear it. Hold on. I don't think that Bitcoin, I've said this before, is widely used as a transaction mechanism. To the extent it's used, I fear it's um, often for illicit finance. Um, it's an extremely inefficient way of um, conducting transactions and the amount of energy that's consumed in processing those transactions is staggering. But it is a highly speculative asset. And, um, you know, I think people should should beware. Um, it it's, can be extremely volatile. And, um, you know, I do worry. I do worry about potential losses that investors in it could suffer. Right. So what I find funny about when they talk about Bitcoin's energy usage is number one, that's subjective when we start talking about wasting energy. Because who are you to say what is and what isn't a waste of energy? Understand that this is really important that you start to really think about what they're saying here. They're basically telling you that for you to reassure your monetary system is effectively what Bitcoin's doing. That's a waste of, of, of energy. Well, then I could say burning your Christmas lights, that's a waste of energy, yet people do it. I can sit up here and I can say, well, you shouldn't wash your laundry and dry your laundry. You should wash it by hand because you're wasting energy when you wash your clothes by hand. I mean, uh, with a machine, you should do it by hand. There's a reason why you would rather burn energy to use your washing machine because it's more efficient because it's better. If I wanted to fly from New York to London, you may think that that's a waste of energy because there's other ways that I can get to London. I could canoe, right? So what may be a waste to you may be a convenience to me. So I always find it funny when I hear people say that, should we stop burning our Christmas lights? Because Christmas lights, they don't serve any utility to the economy or to the greater good, right? It's just wasting energy for pretty lights. Would you rather wash your clothes by hand and not use your washing machine? It's a reason why, because it's more efficient. We could sit up here all day long and play this game as to what is and what isn't a waste of energy. The question you have to say to yourself and ask yourself is how big is the problem that Bitcoin is solving? And is it worth using that much energy? Right. The next question you can pose, you can say, well, how much energy does a traditional banking system use? When you walk here in New York City down Park Avenue right now, it's what, 941 at night? You'll still see lights on inside a building and no one's working in there. How much energy does it require to facilitate that entire system and structure? Think about how much energy the employees have to spend and use in terms of burning fossil fuels to get in their car and come to work every day to transport the money in the armored trucks. That's burning energy as well, too. So if you're going to make that comparison, then we have to look at the comparison of how much energy does the traditional monetary system burn and use. And when she talks about efficiency, that somehow Bitcoin is in an efficient way of moving money around. Well, there are other cryptocurrencies that's faster or quicker than Bitcoin is. And when we take a step back and we ask ourselves, 
Well, how efficient is the dollar? The dollar's lost 90% of its purchasing power since the Federal Reserve Act was created in 1913. The stock market cannot stay up unless the Fed intervenes. So how efficient is this system? This system's basically a Ponzi scheme that we're living in, right? So when when I, I sit up here and I, you know, listen to the things that these people are saying, I understand that, number one, they're just making things up as they go. A chain analysis did a breakdown of the Bitcoin blockchain and less than 2% of all Bitcoin transactions in 2019, I believe, were, was used in criminal activity. So this idea that criminals use crypto, that's just not true because the US dollar is better to use than crypto. Why? Because you can't track a dollar. You actually have a digital footprint when you spend and use your Bitcoin because it's on a public open ledger. The number one funding source for crime and terrorism is the US dollar. So again, either she's saying these things because she's willfully ignorant and i do not believe she's willfully ignorant or she's saying these things to manipulate the market and to just be flat out disingenuous because they view crypto as a threat this is why you have to be you have to be mindful of again who and what you listen to and why you're listening to them you have to make sure that you're paying attention to these things because that's one of the arguments that you constantly people say, well, you know, Bitcoin uses a lot of energy. The financial system uses a lot of energy. Our military uses a lot of energy, right? Right? There's a, a, a lot of mechanisms that goes into securing our monetary system that burns way more energy than Bitcoin ever could burn. So keep those things in mind. Uh, another thing that she spoke about that I wanted to talk about right now Right here, let's play this video. Hold on. It, you know, I, I think it could result in faster, safer, and cheaper payments, mm. um, which I think are important goals. But there are a set of issues around central bank digital currencies that have to be examined. What would be the impact on the banking system? Would it cause a huge movement of deposits out of um, banks and into the Fed? Um, would the Fed deal with retail customers or try to do this at a wholesale level? Um, are there financial stability concerns? How would we manage um, money laundering and illicit finance issues? So there's a lot to consumer right. protection. Now, if you go back to my video from the other day, and I was saying this, banks will not exist in the foreseeable future. Go out three to five years from now, banks will not exist because if the Fed creates a central bank digital currency that will be centralized, and now you have decentralized cryptocurrencies, and you have decentralized finance with DeFi, I promise you the banks will not exist or they will not exist in the capacity that they exist today. And she's basically highlighting that. Because a central bank digital currency and decentralized currencies removes the need for traditional banks. And I say this all the time. You will bank from your phone. Effectively, you're doing that today when you use Zelle and you use Cash App. And when you start using some of these DeFi products and you see how easy it is to get an over collateralized loan within a matter of seconds with Aave and you can borrow and lend and stake, you start to see the power and how effective and quick decentralized finance is to the point where I don't have to step into a bank. I don't have to fill out paperwork. I don't have to wait for an approval process. Literally within a matter of seconds, I can get a loan right on the blockchain. That is going to only get better. That process will only get better and more efficient as we go. The traditional banking sectors in deep trouble. And this right here is the secretary of treasury saying this. Banks will not exist in the capacity that they exist today, especially commercial banks. Now, retail banks, maybe, because it may take a while for especially the boomer population and the older population. They're not that tech savvy, but we're going digital. If, if this doesn't wake you up, then I don't know what will wake you up to what's actually starting to happen. And it was one more video here where she was talking about the economy. <clears throat> Hold on. Okay. 
if you don't spend what it's necessary to get the economy quickly back on track, that has a fiscal cost as well. Uh, a prolonged downturn in the economy, a very slow recovery, um, as we saw after the financial crisis, when there was some fiscal aid, but um, not nearly as much or for as long as was needed, that took a fiscal toll as well. So by having a stronger economy, the money that's spent partially pays for itself. If you don't spend what it's necessary. <laughs> so again, what is the Fed signaling? What's the Treasury Secretary signaling? That they are going to spend what's necessary. She just said it. So I can make these predictions as to what's going to happen because I understand inflation is what has to come. It's very simple. This isn't complicated. Now let's start looking at some of these crashes because I know a lot of you, you want to know, I believe a crash is coming. And when I say a crash, I believe Bitcoin crashed about 20% uh, earlier today. We need about a 30 to 40% pullback in Bitcoin. and the altcoins, it may be a little bit more uh, steep. But just keep these things in mind. This is all of the Bitcoin crashes, I believe, up into 2017. And if you go back to 2012, right here, Bitcoin crashed from $7.38. It crashed all the way down to $3.80. That's a 49% crash. You know what everyone said when this happened? Oh my God, I told you that Bitcoin thing was an absolute scam. And then Bitcoin went from $3.80 all the way up to $16.41. And then Bitcoin crashed from $16.41 all the way down to $7.10. And you know what all of the financial gurus and geniuses said? See, I told you that Bitcoin thing's a scam. Don't buy that Bitcoin thing. And then it went from $7.10 to $49.17. Then it crashed 33%. Then it went to $76.91. Then it went down to $50.09. Then it went up to $259. It crashed 83%. From $259 of April of 2013, all the way down to $45. Guess what the financial media said? Guess what Noria Rabini and Peter Schiff, right? And all of these talking heads on CNBC, that Bitcoin thing will never work. Don't put your money in it. It's a scam. And then it went from $45 all the way up to $755. Then it crashed 50%. Then it went from $378 all the way up to $1,163. And then it crashed down to $152. That was an 87% crash, right? And 2017 went from 1350 to 891, up to 2070, $2,760, crashed down to 1850, went up to 2980, down to 1830, up to 4979, down to 2972 up to 7,888, down to $5,555. And then it went all the way up to $19,666 and then down to $3,538. And now we're sitting here today and let's pull up a chart of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is now trading at what? 52,100, 52, uh, $51,238. Look at all of these different crashes that Bitcoin had. If you simply dollar cost average, meaning you purchased $100 at 738 and you purchased another $100 worth at $3.80. If you just simply kept buying $100 worth of Bitcoin or $500 worth of Bitcoin over time, how much wealth would you have been able to accrue from 2012 up into 2021? This is what you have to keep in mind when you're looking at investing in crypto. Keep these things in mind. So when we look at the overall trend of crypto, give me one second. I want to pull up a chart. Let's pull up Coin Codex because we have to put things into its proper context. 
we come over here and we look at this, right? And we see a 20% correction. For the year, Bitcoin is up 434%, right? Just make sure that you keep things and you, you, you're able to take a step back and you don't get caught up into the day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week fluctuations in price. Overall, Bitcoin for the year is up 434%. I've been on this channel talking about Bitcoin for two and a half years, back when Bitcoin was trading at $3,000 a coin, $4,000 a coin. On my other YouTube channel, I was talking about Bitcoin since it was at six, seven, eight hundred dollars I've been in Ethereum since it was $40 per coin. So if I allowed people to shake me out because we had a 20% drop or 30% drop, then you missed out on all of these gains. We are building a new monetary system as we speak. Bitcoin has a lot of room to run. Think about this. You have Tesla, you have MicroStrategy. What's going to happen when you get 30 or 40% of the S&P 500 to take 1% to 3% of their treasury and allocate it to Bitcoin? Kathy Wood did a study the other day that adds about $900 billion to the market cap of Bitcoin. And there's 547 of you who are watching this. Please hit the like button. It helps the content um, rank and helps the content get out there. I did see a few donations come through. Thank you, TD Hip Hop. I appreciate it. Alexander Wilson, you have two tabs open on about yelling thoughts about her recent comments on Bitcoin. Phil, it's a bunch of hot air. Keep up the good work. No problem. Thank you for the donation, Alexander Wilson. Of course, it's a bunch of hot air, and you, we have to keep these things in mind. And this, like I said, this just goes back to the different crashes. Know what you're buying and why you're buying it. And when you, for example, when I cashed out the other day, when I said that I was cashing on my altcoins, I'm still in Bitcoin. I'm still in Ethereum. I just took some profit because, again, I'm up a lot of money. So when I say I'm cashing out, I cashed out into a stable coin. I didn't cash out into fiat. I'm going to get I'm going to buy back in but into other altcoins. I as I said before, I really want to start allocating capital into the um Polkadot ecosystem because I just think that they have some superior projects that's getting ready to launch to a lot of the other ecosystems that I see out here. Now, Again, when I made this post the other day and I was talking about me taking profit, one of the one of the things that really made me want to take profit is when I see garbage like this with Mark Cuban with these NFTs. I believe in the NFT space. I think that NFTs are, you know, useful. This isn't one of the use cases that I'm talking about. He's selling this NFT, which stands for a non-fungible token. He's selling it for 0 0.02 ETH. And it's basically $43. Look at this garbage. I'm going to play it for you for a second. And then I'm going to, um, you know, explain to you why I feel this way. Where's the audio? I wake every day and scroll the chat. To are truly priceless. So this Pants 90 is for you. Matt Hall 2000. I wake every day and scroll the chat to find the price the punks are at. At the alpha and all the chatter to find the best cheap punks that matter. I scroll and scroll to find my fate, but in the end, it's night like day. Not everybody can have one of these. A rookie card of NFTs. That is so cringe. Why would you, what, what is valuable about this? When I look at this, I, I say, oh, my God, I can't believe that someone paid $42 for this. This is junk. This is garbage. This is a gimmick. So let's really unpack this and let's start talking about NFTs, because a lot of you, you want to know about, you know, non-fungible tokens. I'm a big gamer. I like to play games. So this is one use case that I can see for non-fungible tokens. One game, I've been playing this game now for probably four years now. It's called Warframe. And the way Warframe starts out is it's a free-to-play game, but they have a currency inside of the game. 
the currency is platinum. Now, there's two ways that you can get platinum in the game. You either can buy platinum packs with actual real world money, like dollars or euros, or you can farm parts and pieces for different Warframes and you can sell it to other people within the game for platinum. Now, you get a Warframe to start the game named Excalibur. So they have base level Warframes and then they have prime level Warframes. And these Warframes are unlocked every, like every week they unlock a special frame or every month, right? And then what happens is that frame is available for one month. So it's a character basically that you can play with. And then that character goes back into the vault for the rest of the year. And they won't come back out until the company wants to release it. So now you have to farm those pieces for that particular Warframe up until that vault closes. Now, think about it. If you're new to the game and you want Excalibur Prime, the only way you can get Excalibur Prime is you have to buy it from me for Platinum or wait till it's available again. So now you can have special pieces in the game that are rare, a non-fungible token, right? That no one else has. And you can basically say, I'm going to create 50 of these swords. And these swords have a special, they have a special look to it and they have special characteristics and special powers. And now those 50 swords are valuable within the game. And now if you're one of the people who has those 50 swords, you can sell it for a premium. So therefore now it creates value in a game. Think about a Fortnite dance. You might think that, oh man, that has no value, no utility. There are kids who spend thousands of dollars on skins for their Fortnite guns, for dances for their characters. That's the real value and non-fungible tokens in gaming. Huge, huge, huge business. Kids spend billions of dollars on game features and game characteristics. Again, I'm a gamer. I spend, I'll spend a hundred dollars on a pack of platinum so that I can buy um, you know, a special gun for my character. I like I like the game Doom. When you pre-order a game, you get a special shotgun and it has a special flair to it. That's where non-fungible tokens will excel. Garbage like this, this is a joke, right? This is just Mark Cuban rapping or talking and someone turned it into a song. Now, yes, it's a marketplace for this, but people are only buying it because they want to try to resell it. People are not buying this non-fungible token because they believe that it's something, you know, that people want to use, right? So this is why you have to understand that's where non-fungible tokens will shine, right? Because each piece on your character is different, right? Each sword is different in the game. And I may have a sword that came out for, you know, two years ago with the release and you being new to the game, you may want that sword. So now it has value within the game for the people who are playing the game. So you're seeing a lot of people work on, you know, work within the NFT space to, to do that. This is where you're going to start to see a lot of value um, come into the NFT space. Um, even when you start thinking about music, for example, um, artists coming into the space and creating, let's say they may create, they may license out a thousand copies of their song, right? And only a thousand copies will exist within this particular ecosystem. That's where NFTs shine. Why? Because the artist has a brand. The artist has a following. Music can do things to you. Music can make you happy. Music can make you sad. That's where I can see non-fungible tokens shining, where you're actually creating something that's scarce, that has utility, and that actually has a marketplace that people want and need. This, to me, is, is gimmicky 100%. And when, when I see this type of stuff, I say, ah, this is a joke. This is just people basically coming into the space um, and, you know, trying to gimmick and, and play around with it. So, um, NFTs based around like business or sports memorabilia. I can see that being real big. As I said before, contracts, exclusive content from artists that can be a real big space, but like JPEGs, literally people are selling JPEGs and, and stuff like this. This, this is gimmicky. And this is just, this is telling me that the market's overheated right now. And we just, we need a little bit of a pullback 
to um, clear out some of the stuff that we're starting to see. I wouldn't say we're in a bubble right now. I would just simply say that we need a pullback. I mean, you even see the uh, saw the uh, S and P five hundred begin to pull back today as well, and that's just simply because we saw Treasuries start to spike the ten year. But if you look at the overall trend on the ten year, it's still headed down. So in the short term, could we see this spike to maybe two percent? Yeah. But I believe the Fed's going to step right in and start buying up these treasury bonds and, and push the yield down. So I, I wouldn't worry about that. We understand that they have to keep interest rates low and eventually interest rates will go negative. Joel Hogan says Decentraland. Yes, Engine Coin is Engine Coin ENJ is one of those coins that I like um, for the NFT space. Let's see where it's at right now. Engine Coin is a solid project, solid team. They've been around. I actually have some um, e, uh, ENJ. It was uh, airdropped to me years ago on Binance. I know that it's in the top. I believe it's in the top 100. Right? Let's just look it up. Let's pull it up so we can see. Um. Oh, it's not. It's, it's ranked one hundred and fourth. It's down twenty six percent from its all time high. So yeah, this is definitely a solid project, solid team, something that you would um want to take a look at. One more thing I want to say before I take some questions and wrap this up. I always bring up Jeff Booth, and if you're in the academy. This is a book that I always tell you guys to go and read. If you've been following me for a while, you know I always highlight this thread. Uh, the book that Jeff Booth um, is the author of is The Price of Tomorrow. Definitely go and take a look at that book. But this is how I understand what's to come. And when we talk about the treasury yield on the, the, the yield on a 10 year treasury, when we talk about debt and deficit, when we talk about government spending stimulus, I understand that it's going to be more of the same. The only way out of this is to print more money and devalue the dollar. This is why you need Bitcoin. This is why gold will always play a role. I own gold. This is why stocks will always go up because it's an asset bubble. Jeff Booth posted, in the game of Monopoly, once enough properties are owned by a single player, renters can afford to pay rents and therefore are forced into renters can't afford to pay rent and are therefore forced into bankruptcy and the game ends for those who have played you will notice how the system works i.e once you have an early advantage the game becomes easier because you have the rents to acquire more properties and add more houses slash hotels a positive feedback loop is created, concentrating wealth. You might also notice that the wealth in the game might be due to luck. Landing on the right squares early in the game gives you a massive advantage. Right place, right time. Conversely, missing out on acquiring those assets early creates a negative feedback loop, which also reinforces on itself. The poor become poorer until they become insolvent as they move around the board paying higher and higher rents. Fortunately, it is just a game. The game ends. Someone gets bragging rights and all are given a fresh chance to win when the game begins anew, with everyone being equal. But what would happen if the same positive and ne negative feedback loops happened in life, with the winners acquiring ever more because they had the assets first, concentrating their wealth and enjoying privileged access to the best education, medical and other services. And for the sake of argument, let's imagine in this life game that there was a giant force, let's call it a central bank, that would not let asset prices fall, which only concentrated wealth faster and wouldn't allow a reset of the game where new players had a chance. How long would the losers of the game keep playing the game 
when they realized that the game was rigged against them? What if they couldn't pay their rent, medical bills, education, with the game continuing to get worse? What if the game wouldn't end for them? What would they do? More importantly, if you were them, what would you do? You might listen and elect leaders who tell you they will give you free money without asking where that money comes from or rise up against the winners and burn the game to the ground revolutions or three play a game where you had a chance which is bitcoin and gold the societal consequences of changing the rules of the game to stop the natural clearing function of markets and lock new players out is making the world ever more dangerous the consequences are very predictable and the crazy thing is the same thing central banks are fighting against prices falling because of exponentiality advancing technology exponentially advancing technology might be the best game we ever played i love to read this because it highlights what's happening now you have the boomers and the people before us they got to benefit from inflation. They could buy their home for $30,000 30 years ago, and every year their home would appreciate 3%, 5%, 6%, to the point where when my dad was growing up, they could buy a house for 40 grand. That same house in that same neighborhood now goes for a half a million dollars and up, right? Nothing effectively changed, just the value of your money. You could buy a car for, you know, $5,000, $6,000 30 years ago. Now a, a decent car runs you 30 grand, 34 grand, 28 grand for a, a decent, you know, fully loaded car. Think about the cost of education. You could go to school $3,000, $4,000. Now a four year education runs you about 40 grand, 50 grand. That's all inflation. And instead of the Fed allowing markets to correct themselves, they constantly intervene by injecting liquidity into the market. The problem is, is that those that should go bankrupt and allow new players to come in, they never get a chance to go bankrupt. Like look at American Airlines. They should have been bankrupt right now. See, in Bitcoin, there are no bailouts. There's no central bank. There is no Jerome Powell. There will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. And this is why so many people um, are enamored by the system as to what it can possibly do when we actually have a deflationary asset rather than an inflationary asset. And by definition, when you have the Fed saying inflation's too low, you are using your most valuable asset and commodity, which is your time. You can never get back your time and you're exchanging it for pieces of paper. And the Fed is saying that losing 3% of its purchasing power every year isn't enough, that they want to spur and create more inflation, and that inflation benefits people who hold assets. So, and this is why there's so much calcification of wealth at the top. And then you have to think about who's this wealth being passed down to? And is that wealth being, you know, it, is, is the wealth... Is access to the wealth attainable for, you know, the average person, right? Do, is, is it fair? Is the game, are the rules to the game open or do they change the rules of the game as they see fit to always benefit themselves? And we can see that this isn't a fair game. The rules aren't in your favor. The deck stacked against you. And that's effectively what he's saying effectively is that they own all of the real estate. So this is why you see the stock market consistently going up. You see real estate prices consistently going up and the rich get richer and they just keep consolidating power. So I would encourage you to definitely go and read this book. If you're in the academy, this is a list of all of the books that I tell you to go and read because you will have such a better understanding. If out of this entire list, the two books that I would definitely tell you to read is The Creature from Jekyll Island and The Price of Tomorrow. If you read those two books, you'll be far ahead of most people who really truly don't have a clue as to what's coming and now i'll come over to the chat um i saw a donation come through i don't know anything about chain games 
what do you think about chain games i don't know about chain games token um i'll put that on a list i'm going to do a review of theta and zillica this weekend because that's what most of you voted for i put up a poll thank you for the donation um i put up a poll here when was it i did a poll about a week ago so i'm going to, to do a review on zillica and theta this weekend i've been doing some research on that Eli, is there a way to get around ETH fees? I transferred ETH from Coinbase Pro to my ledger and the fees were ridiculous. Any advice is appreciated. Well, everyone's using what's the name right now? The Binance Smart Chain to get around Ethereum fees. Um, the only thing I can honestly tell you is when you're buying or swapping to use Loop Ring. But if you're going to send it to your wallet, there's no way of getting around it. The fees are just going to be really, really high. Um, one one so, so solution I can do uh give you is that you can go to ETH gas station. So I'll pull it up for you right now. Hold on. Um uh ETH gas station. You can monitor this right here. Give me one second. So what you can do is you can actually look at this and wait for the fees to actually come down. So like right now, if you want it to be, you know, extremely fast. You're paying 429 guay. That's that's pretty steep. Um, I would say wait, wait to fees drop. Like before you make that transfer, wait to this for this to drop to about 250 ish for fast, 150 for standard. So the best times and days to wait is probably wait between like 12 and 4 a.m. I'm in the the Eastern time zone. Is a good thing to do. A good time to wait for it and on the weekends late at night but this is why everyone's using the binance smart chain right now to get around ethereum fees so but really there's no way of getting around it to be honest with you if you want to stay on the ethereum chain there there aren't any ways that i can think of right now so monitor eth gas station Wait for the fees to drop down. So wait till we get to about like 250 So like I got monitor it's like right now in dare send a, I would not dare send a transaction right now with you know the fast transaction costing 429 guay that's just that's insane I definitely wouldn't do that I hope that answers your question the Riddler that's really the only ways that I can think of honestly uh, in your MetaMask wallet you can uh, come here I'll show you this too I'll show you another trick um Oh, give me one second. Let me log in. I'll share this with you as well. Mm. Let's log into my wallet. Um, one, three. So. Give me one second, I'll walk you through this. I need a recipient to send to. Let me see something. So what we can do here. Right, so um you see my screen, right? So if I wanted to send I wanted to send ETH to someone. Right, you can go here to advanced options and you could actually set the limit for like how much you want to pay inside of your actual MetaMask wallet. So this is another way that you can like basically set the fee that you're willing to pay. The problem is, is that if your fee is too low, um, your transaction could get stuck. 
So let's go back here. So that you can see a slow, you have slow, average, and fast. So right here, they're charging me $12 to send this transaction fast. It'll cost me, and that's just, I'm not even putting any ETH in here. So, so I don't, I can't zoom in. I don't know if you can see it, but it says slow is $10. Average is 12 and fast is about 18. And obviously once I put like, let's say I wanted to send two or, you know, three ETH, it definitely will probably cost me like $50, maybe $70 to send this transaction. So you can come here to the advanced options and you can basically set your price. But again, if it's too low, your transaction will get stuck. It won't get it won't get processed. And then you'll basically lose out, you know, on your ETH. So be smart about that. Um, I like the lit coin, Timothy Woods. I really think that identity on the blockchain is going to be big. Uh, that's the next project that I'm about to dive into in a major way. Lit's going to be a project on my my list. I'm waiting for it to pull back. Um, my my buy zone for that project is between eight and about five dollars. I think Lit's going to be a, a really really good project. That's next on my list. As I said before, I cashed out a lot of my other projects. Some of them I was up twenty x, so I made a, a significant amount of money in those projects. And now I'm looking at some projects within the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, see, uh, Mr. Chair, you can use loop ring to swap your coins, but once you want to send them to your, he wants to send them to his wallet, to his ledger. There's no way of getting around it from sending it from your, to sending it to your ledger. You're going to pay a high fee to send it to your ledger. Right. Loop ring from my experience is cheap to swap from loop ring and um send to other people but it's going to you're going to pay that high fee in order to um send it to your wallet there's no way getting around it um what we could do so um for those of you who do not know what loop ring is um loop ring utilizes zk rollups makes it very easy so Definitely take a look at Loop Ring. I just posted it in the chat. This is a way that you can um, definitely get some uh, swap free different cryptocurrencies with ETH. But again, sending it to your wallet is going to be expensive. If you send crypto from, even if you send it from Loop Ring, it's going to be expensive to send it to your wallet. Um, I have Omega. I have mixed feelings about uh, EIP 1559. I don't believe that it's going to solve Ethereum uh, scaling problems. Burning burning fees won't solve the problem. Um, even if you raise the gas limit, it won't affect the state of the chain. So this is the biggest problem of blockchains and. I say this all the time, is that blockchains are designed to be slow. They're not designed to be fast. They're not designed to have all of the throughput at the base layer. This is why you, you have to think of it like how the internet is structured. You have to stack other layers on top of it to allow that throughput to go through. So um, this is where sharding the chain comes into play, where you can have 64 chains running at one time and different chains handling different transactions. To me, I think that that's the most feasible uh, solution right now to uh, making the blockchain more efficient and being able to process more transactions and bringing down the fees. Because remember, you're always going to be competing for a fixed amount of space, right? A blockchain is just a database. Think of it. You have a block. That block can only hold a certain amount of transactions at the base layer. So you're competing based upon how high your fee is. The miners are going to take the higher fees and they're going to dump them into the blocks. That's just the way it goes. And if your fee is not high enough, you're not going to make it into that block because there's a limited amount of space for the block. Um, so I I've looked into EIP uh, 1559 and, you know, to me, it just it seems like a bunch of techno babble. And that's one of the one of the things I've noticed about, you know, crypto in general. You have a lot of smart people who just want to sit around all day long and intellectually masturbate. 
and they want to talk about um you know well if we did this and we did that and they really just talk over your head in reality eip 1559 in my opinion doesn't fix anything right that's just my personal opinion so i've i've looked into it briefly um and then the miners are not going to want to go along with it right because now effectively what you're saying is you're taking revenue from the miners right think about it like if if i'm a miner I get I spent all of this money to secure the network and basically what you're saying is that you want to you know take a, a portion of the actual fees generated and burn them. I don't think that that's going to work out well. And you just, you're seeing the miners they don't want to get on board with that because you're basically taking money out of their pocket. Cuz effectively when you have a proof of work blockchain you're at the mercy of the miners. Right? The miners basically they're protecting your network and they're validating your transactions, right? So they're not going to want to go along with this. So now what happens to the security of the network if you start to take revenue from the miners? Right? These are these are things that you have to you have to think about. Um when you start introducing these new, you know, um improvement proposals, right? Cuz that's what EIP 1559 is, it's an Ethereum improvement proposal. Um so when you when you start saying, hey, well, we're going to try to take some revenue to make it more fair or equitable, then, uh, you know, so. Because effectively, from from the way I understand it, is that they would basically raise the gas limit depending on, um, I believe, like the 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 previous the, the previous blocks coming in. So if like the, the transit, if they're hitting the the upper threshold of the gas limit. Then they're increase the gas limit and then burn the excess fees. Right? So like Omega says, the miners will leave, I guess. Yeah, but then what if the miners decide that they want to attack the network then? See, this this is this is what happened with Bitcoin and Blockstream, right? Like Blockstream effectively, you know, the miners they they held the they held the Bitcoin network hostage because the miners, the the miners, they you're basically Look at it this way, right? I have 10 bodyguards that protect me. Well, what if those 10 bodyguards say, okay, if you don't give us more money, then we're just going to rob you, <laughs> right? So basically, your bodyguards start to hold you hostage, right? Because remember, the whole idea of um, miners is they protect you against civil attacks and replay attacks and reorg attacks, right? So... If I have my 10 bodyguards and I do something they don't like, well, those 10 bodyguards can now say, hey, you know, we're going to hold you ransom. So this is what happens now. What happened if those miners decided they want to start, you know, colluding and attacking the network? So it, 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 it's, a, it's a tricky balance, right? It's a delicate balance. And it, this is one of the problems with proof of work. It becomes hard. This is why I try to tell you guys that this technology is not easy. It, they're, they're, there aren't any um, uh, easy fixes to this, right? Like the, there, there aren't any easy fixes. People try to say like, oh, you know, we're just going to do this and, and everything. We just increase the gas limit. Well, that doesn't change the the fact that the state of the chain is still bloated. It doesn't doesn't fix those things. So you have to just keep these things in mind. Um, right, this technology is not easy, and uh, I, I, again, there are people much smarter than me working on this, and like I talk to them, and um, they're even conflicted. Like, think about it: you you have people who they have PhDs in you know um, database design, cryptography, um, game theory, because you got right. This goes back to game theory. Your incentive. The way that Bitcoin is structured is everyone's incentivized to play by the rules. I'm going to spend my electricity because I want to get rewarded. I want to get a percentage of the next block reward, right? If I try to append a transaction to the blockchain or add, you know, a block to the blockchain and it, it, one of the transactions are incorrect, then I basically wasted my electricity and I don't get that block reward. Right. So I'm incentivized to do the right thing. Like I'm going to spend my electricity in mine because I'm going to get rewarded, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum. 
right? So everyone's incentives line up with that game theory, right? But then when you start saying that you're going to try to take some of my reward away, well, then I may be incentivized, right? It may be economically viable for me to try to attack the network in that instance. So th these, these are things that you just got to keep in mind. So I, I briefly looked into EIP 1559 and I, I don't think raising the gas limit or dynamically adjusting the gas limit, um, depending on supply and demand. I don't think that that's a good idea. I believe that e I believe that, um, I wouldn't say it's not a good idea. I don't believe that it's a, I don't believe it's a solution to high fees, right? Because what you have to understand is that you're, you're going to, you're going to be bumping up against the threshold again in, in terms of the, the gas limit, because these products are only going to get better and they're only going to get, become more and more in demand. Now, some people keep saying, well, that's bullish on, on Cardano. Cardano hasn't proven anything. See, Ethereum has proven that they actually can deliver. Right? Ethereum has proven that they could deliver. <clears throat> Miners do not have to play by the rules. Like Mr. G, you you have you have to stop you have to stop saying stuff like this, like that. That's just not that's not true. If 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 miners didn't get their way back in the segment fork, they would have attacked the Bitcoin network. <laughs> My, they they would have they would have they definitely miners miners are holding the Bitcoin blockchain hostage just like any other proof of work blockchain. You're overpaying for security. You're paying you're paying an exorbitant amount of fees, and most blockchains are not attacked by fifty one percent attacks. Right, bit bit Bitcoin, Bitcoin has had two inflation bugs. Two, that is the worst way, the worst way that a blockchain could be attacked is having a bug. Blockchains fail most of the time. This technology fails with bugs not 51% attacks. So you're paying very, very, very high fees to miners. Bitcoin has the same problem. You're overpaying miners for protection. It's a racket. You are being held hostage by the miners the same, the same way that Ethereum is being held hostage by the miners. This is the problem with proof of work and will always be the problem with proof of work, which is why some people prefer prefer to use proof of stake because effectively at the end of the day, you have to pay your miners for protection. And those miners at times will definitely, definitely want higher fees, right? Miners going to mine. Um, I don't know too much about Elrond, to be honest with you. I, I've heard about Elrond. I don't know much about it. Um, but again, anytime someone's telling you that they can do a lot of throughput, just ask, ask them what's the security model on those transactions, right? Right. So people, listen, I've, I've been around crypto for a very, very long time. People will tell you that they can do all these different transactions. The blockchain can fly. It can have unicorns. Show me. The Riddler, you you haven't been around long enough to know about those Bitcoin fees. Um, there was a time, it, I remember when a Bitcoin transaction could take you almost six hours to process. I, I don't know about Voyager, um, Edward Garcia. I, I haven't looked at it. People keep sending it to me. I haven't looked at it. What do you think about ETH 2.0 proof of... Like, I meant to say stake versus stack. Um, I, I believe I believe that Ethereum 2.0 will be a major success. I think that as out of all of the solutions that I've looked at so far, I believe sharding the blockchain by far is the best one that I've come across. Um, the problem is that this stuff takes time. And if you want to have decentralization, it takes even more time to properly execute these things. Um, you cannot rush this. We're, we're, 
we will see what happens once Gogan is released on the first. We'll we'll see how uh, what happens. We'll we'll see what happens with Gogan. This is why I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a firm believer in polka dot. See, this is my philosophy. If Ethereum fails, then I believe any any proof of stake blockchain will fail. Um, so the whole idea of Polkadot is that you are against chain maximalism, right? Polkadot wants to be the bridge to all blockchains. And I think that that's a better way to go, especially when you start talking about the Web 3.0. And I think that that's a I think that the philosophy where being the bridge to multiple multiple blockchains at once, I think that that's the best way to go. I just don't I don't know if. Technologically, it's possible, but that philosophy, in my opinion, is the best way to go. This this whole idea of one chain that will rule them all, I I you know I don't believe that that's going to happen. So I, I like where Polkadot is trying to go, and I think that that to me is a uh, um. I would want to invest and bet on that, than bet on just one chain ruling them all. So that's why I'm a, a huge fan of um the Polkadot project. And what they're trying to do. And that's why I've, I've from day one, I've been on this channel talking about polka dots since it was four dollars. Right. That's that's why I'm a huge, huge, huge believer. So my money's on Ethereum because Ethereum has captured the network effect. It has the branding. It has the most developers. It has the most dApps. It has the most amount of value locked into Ethereum right now. Compared to any other smart contract platform. So that's where I currently am at. Stefan update. What 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 does my gas fees have anything to do with anything? That's pointless, right? I don't know anything about that, JB, right? Um I don't know anything about I would have to look. I haven't looked in the wallet. No, Moonbeam's not available yet. Moon, you have to get on the actual waiting list for Moonbeam. Moonbeam is going to be a really big project. Um, That's another one that I'm waiting for. That's why I cashed out. I'm waiting for Moonbeam. I want to put some money in Lit. Uh, and there's a few different Lits. So let me show you which one I'm talking about and looking at right now. Um, Right now, it's down 18%. So... My kill zone is between about eight to six dollars, maybe eight to five dollars is where I would want to start allocating capital. Um, this product right here. Latentry. Really, really good project. I like the project. I like where it's going. Market caps only one hundred and fifty million dollars. This is something I'm definitely going to start putting some major money into. I covered NFTs earlier, um, Jody M Matasi. Um, mm, 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 mm. No, uh, uh, Ethereum Classic is a completely separate blockchain from Ethereum. Those are two separate blockchains. ETH 2.0 is just the upgraded version of Ethereum. Um, again, I haven't, I believe strike is the, the, the guy he, he created that the, the new wallet. I don't know too much about that project and a wallet of Satoshi. I don't know. I don't know anything about those projects. That's the thing about a theory. I mean, oh, crypto guys, there's so much going on. I'm mainly focused on Ethereum. If you haven't noticed, like that's where all my attention's at, because I believe that that's the superior by far. Ethereum is a superior blockchain to all blockchains. Um, it's only a matter of time before Ethereum flips Bitcoin. Um, to me, Bitcoin is like dated technology. Uh, Bitcoin will be digital gold. It will sit on top of the Ethereum blockchain. That's, that's my philosophy. So that's why you mainly see me focusing on things in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, I don't really look at a lot of other projects unless they're within Ethereum. So I don't know too much about Strike. 
I believe that 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 was the guy he was working with the football player that um is going to get paid in Bitcoin. Right, but that's where I put all my focus at. That's why mainly I'm more knowledgeable about things happening within the Ethereum ecosystem because by far Ethereum is the Ethereum is a superior technology to everything else out here. Everything at this point is a test net. Right? When I when I look at everything else is a test net. Right? So when I when I look at Cardano, when I look at Polkadot, exciting technology, but it's not proven right now. Yeah, a uh, Courtney Gibson. I I would never I, I could never see myself doing BlockFi of uh, and recommending BlockFi. Number one, look how much money I lost with Mt. Gox. I I should be worth <laughs> well over $15, $20 million today with the amount of money that I lost between Butterfly Labs and um uh, Mt. Gox. Seriously. So when I when I see BlockFi, I'm not excited by about putting my money with BlockFi to earn six percent. Because I know that my Bitcoin is valuable because it's valuable to institutional investors. That the best place for your Bitcoin is either sitting in a protocol somewhere where you're earning your own interest or you're basically doing this, right? Holding your own keys, not your keys, not your crypto. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Earl Edney, I, I think Adam's a solid project. Um, Matic is a solid project. Adam's a solid project. V chains, is, although I sold those projects, those are still solid projects. It's just, it's time to rotate my money, right? I've made a lot of money in Adam. I made a lot of money in Matic. I made a lot of money in V chain. So now it's time to, um, you know, roll roll that money into other things. It says you still believe in Adam. Adam has sort of the same vision as Polkadot. Yes, interoperability is what they call it, right? Where basically you can have multiple blockchains talking to each other. Um, I, If you've noticed that most of my investments are into either data infrastructure or interoperability because I'm hedging myself. Um, I, I Right now, I believe Ethereum has by far first mover's advantage, but investing in the infrastructure is going to be important. That's why I like the graph token. So when I look at Chainlink, Chainlink is the bridge between the real world and the blockchain, right? If you want to get real world data into the blockchain, you need oracles. Chainlink is by far the superior oracle. When I look at the graph token, you need to be able to index data, right? Because when you look at these dApps, when they build on top of the Ethereum blockchain, they have to go to some centralized entity to get data or that, that's indexed or build their own indexes. Well, the graph token does that for you. Um, that's powerful. And then when I, look, when I look at Cosmos with interoperability, that, that makes sense to me. So those are the things that I want to um, invest in. Nash Nash made it one two six. You're saying should I buy crypto on Coinbase? Yes. When you are first starting, you should buy your crypto on Coinbase. There's a spectrum, right? Understand. I've been doing this for eight years now, so how I invest and what I do is going to be completely different than what you do. Also, how much money do you have invested? If you have a couple thousands of dollars, a couple thousand dollars invested. Then you leave it on Coinbase, leave it on Binance. It's a small amount of money. If you have a sizable amount of money, if you plan on holding this stuff for a really, really long time, again, I'm moving a quarter million dollars at a time. You think I care about gas fees? Gas fees don't matter to me. I care more about security and ownership of my asset. For you, you just want to trade and make 20, 30, 40% here or there then Coinbase Pro Gemini's a good place for you to go. It's all about the spectrum as to what you plan on doing, right? If I have $1,000 worth of crypto, I'm not going to be moving it around that much. It's a little bit of money. I'm not, you know, knocking you or disparaging you, but that's a small amount of money. If I have a big amount of money. I don't trust my crypto on an exchange because Coinbase can get hacked. Binance can get hacked. They can go bankrupt. 
Right? So it, it it's it's a spectrum as to you know security. Also, your technical limitations will just de determine what you um you know what your security should be, right? Your operations your your operational security should depend on whether or not you're tech savvy. If you're tech savvy and you know how to use a ledger, then you use a ledger. Some people they don't feel comfortable remembering their seed phrase and they can store it properly. So then a, a, a private key isn't for you. I mean, um, a hardware wallet isn't for you, and managing your private keys are not for you, right? It's 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 up to you, right? Like these the, these are these are things that you you have to, and this is what I talk about inside of the academy. Um, what do I think of Kraken compared to Coinbase? Uh, Coinbase, Coinbase Pro. I think Coinbase, Coinbase Pro is superior for U.S. customers. I just think that Coinbase is the be better place to go. Easier to use, better UI, better design. Uh, thank you for the donation, JB. He says, so it's about opportunity costs. You make 10x in the graph. It most likely won't make another 10x for a while. So you take that profit and put it in the lit, whose 10x potential is higher at this point. Absolutely, JB. Um, that's my thinking process, right? I tend to remember, go back and watch my videos. I said to you, to me, at the end of the year, I can see the graph token being worth about three to five billion dollars. Just because if you're looking at if you look at the token distribution of the graph token, they're going to be dumping a lot of supply, meaning new supply of the token will be coming onto market over the next six months, right? They have a bunch of tokens in escrow and then founders, they're going to start dumping the token too. Think about it, right? If I'm a founder and I, I'm in this token from 20 cents and I watch it trade at three or $4 now, they're humans too. They have bills that they have to pay. You don't think that they're going to start selling and dumping onto the marketplace. Now, I don't know the exact lockup period for them, but I know that for a fact that they have a lot of supply coming into the market over the next three to six months. So if I 10x my money, 12x my money, do I want to deal with that? Now, the market could eat that, eat up that supply and keep going, but it's like I'm I'm up 10x. Take some off the table and look to recycle that money into other projects that will 10x. So, and I, as I said before, I want to start getting more into the Polkadot ecosystem. I'm, I'm heavily invested into the Ethereum ecosystem. I think it's time to get involved in the Polkadot ecosystem. That's another thing that I've been working on. Um, why I haven't been streaming a lot lately is just really learning about the Polkadot system and the different power chains and the Kusama, uh, the test net, which is Kusama, which is worth like, I believe, $2 billion. It's insane that a test net is worth billions of dollars. So there's just a lot of things that I want to learn about that system and staking within that system. Because I believe that there's going to be some real monster co coins that will come out and projects that will come out of the Polkadot ecosystem. So that's how I'm looking at it, right? Basically just rolling my money into different things. Um, I believe that Ethereum, where, where do I think ETH would be at? Uh, easily, I believe Ethereum would be above $5,000. Easily, I believe ETH would be above 5K. As um, long as there's no major bugs, right? We, you have to understand we're dealing with technology. So if there's like some fatal bug in ETH, then it'll, it'll die. But um, barring any fatal bugs, I, I, I see Ethereum easily being over $5,000 at the end of the year. I would, I would be surprised if by summertime, ETH's not above $5,000. It's, it's, it's just Ethereum by far is superior to everything. E ETH is better than Bitcoin. It's better money than Bitcoin. It's faster than Bitcoin. It is by far out outside of the fees. Like a, there's nothing, there's nothing that Bitcoin or any of these other projects has on Ethereum. By far. So um, I'm, a, I'm a huge bull in ETH. Like ETH is technically superior to Bitcoin in every way. And so if Bitcoin's a trillion dollars, I just don't see why another, you know, 200 billion won't pour into ETH. Because see, what you have to think about when you're looking at Ethereum, is I said this yesterday, look at how many applications are built on top of Ethereum. 
they're taking market share from ETH, right? They're taking market cap from ETH. Think about it. Chainlink is built on top of Ethereum. That's $11 billion that's not in the in, invested in ETH. Excuse me. When I look at Aave, that's $4 billion. Uniswap, $4 billion, right? Like th that's that's those are billions of dollars that's not invested in ETH, that's invested in Uni or Aave. So that money would be going into Ethereum, right? So the reason why Bitcoin is a trillion dollars because Bitcoin just, it does, it's a like a dumb rock. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there, right? So when you see all of these things being built on top of ETH, that's money that's not going into ETH, but going into those projects, right? So you 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 have to keep these things in mind when you are, you know, looking at these things. So you have to keep those things in mind. Right. So that's a lot of market share being taken away from Ethereum because of the successful applications being built on top of ETH. So now, again, a lot of you asking me about Cardano. Um, remember, Gavin is the founder of Polkadot. He actually um, wrote the um, Solidity programming language for Ethereum. He was one of the co-founders of Ethereum. And then Charles, who's the co-founder of Cardano, he was one of the co-founders of ETH as well. They all went on to build their own projects. I believe that Cardano is going to do really well financially. Uh, I believe investing in Cardano, you're going to do well because it will live in it will live in a shadow of Ethereum. It's like the little brother, right? Like you know, Ethereum's the big brother, and then Cardano will be the little brother that lives in the shadow. Um, and it it'll, it'll basically try to piggyback and copy everything that Ethereum is doing, right? So you'll see them. You're going to see Cardano build a clone of Uniswap. You're going to see them build a clone of Aave, a clone of Synthetics, right? So anything that's successful on Ethereum, you're going to see Cardano launch it. And they're going to say, oh, look, this is the Ethereum killer. And the reason why the fees will be lower is because they do not have the amount of users and congestion in their network that ETH has. So, you know, it, they're going to market themselves and tout themselves as, yeah, look, we're the Ethereum killer. Um, right. So it's going to be laughable. It, it, it'll be funny to watch it. It'll be funny to watch. It'll be funny to watch the Cardano boast, you know, get excited. So March 1st is the, the time for Cardano to put up or shut up. Yeah. Maker is a beast project. I always forget about maker and, um, uh, what's the name? Cause basically makers like the reserve bank for the Ethereum ecosystem. I forget about Maker. I always forget about Compound. I never met. Those are two good projects too. I just, I, I'm I'm always talking about my projects, but Maker's a good project. Compound's a solid project. Look at Maker. Maker's up 252% for the year. Uh, Compound's up 365% for the year. They have a lot of room to run. It's only worth what? 1.8 billion. Maker's worth 2.2 billion. If, if these gas fees weren't so high, these projects would be much higher. Oh my God, look at Voyager. You know, the funny thing is I had a chance to get into Voyager. I was in Clubhouse and um, someone pitched Voyager to me. Jesse pitched Voyager to me. And I just, I, at the time, I didn't have a chance to really look at it because I have so much going on. I have the Academy. I have, um, for those of you who are looking to learn about crypto, I have my own Academy. So I'm, I'm busy working on content for the Academy. Um, I'm investing money for people because people I invest money in different in crypto and stocks and stuff for people. Um, I have so much on my plate. So I didn't really have a chance to really look at um, Voyager the way that I wanted to. So that sucks. I missed out on some big gains. Uh, for those of you interested in learning about crypto. No. I don't want to preview ID. Put this link in the chat for you. We have a look. It says seven day trial. It's not seven days. It's three days. This must be a cached site. That's why. I hate when they do when when that happens. So this is a, I got to clear my cache because it's a three day trial. It's not a seven day trial. That's the link though for those of you that are interested.
Um, oh, you say, so like what's comp below said, what's comparable to ETH? That's like $100. So uh, I like this project right here. Um, Avalanche. Uh, AVAX at twenty nine ninety four. They recently had a double spend though, so you should be careful with looking at them. Um, but um, solid project, solid team, solid technology. I like the guy Emin, really, really bright, really smart. That's what I look for when I'm listening to a person speak. I I, I want to see. To me, a sign of intelligence is someone who could take something complex and complicated and simplify it. So Emin is really, really smart. He's really active on Twitter. That's another thing I like to look for is whether or not these people are active in their in their community. So Avalanche, it's trading at twenty nine eighty six. Solid project. It's a smart contract platform. It's only worth two billion dollars, right? So it's trying to compete with Cardano for second place in the smart contract space. So if you look at this, it's worth two billion. Cardano is worth, I think, about twenty, right? Cardano is worth. 33 billion. So you have about a 10 X of room if it could get up there. So that's a solid one. Um, what's another one? I, I believe it was Elron that a lot of you was asking me about. I believe that that's a, another platform. So there's, there's some, there's a few, but that's the one I like. I like avalanche. I was talking about Avalanche back when it was five dollars. I just never had a chance to put any money in it because you get to a point where you're you're tapped out. Yeah, Courtney Gibson. That's that's my philosophy. Um, Ethereum, Polkadot, Ethereum, Polkadot, Bitcoin, GRT, and Chainlink is where I'm going. By far, I'm I I believe that Chainlink is winner takes all, um, because if Cardano wins, they're going to use some variation of Chainlink, right? Because it's an Oracle, right? So they're already working with Polkadot. Excuse me. So by far, Chainlink's a monster. Yeah, I dumped Tezos. I got rid of Tezos, Rich Hoff. Um, Tezos is another smart contract platform. That's another one too. Um, I made a killing in V Chain. I I had to take profit in V Chain. I just um, V Chain was by far like my one of my best runners. Um, yeah, this is Tezos right here. It's three ninety three dollars and ninety seven cents. So you can't really focus on price. You have to focus on um the market cap. Right, because something can have a high price but a low market cap, and then something like like garbage like Ripple. Ripple has a low like look at Ripple. It's only fifty four cents, but the market cap is twenty three billion. So in order for Ripple to double in price, you need another twenty three billion dollars to come in, right? So it's easier for Tezos to double in price than Ripple, although Ripple is cheaper in you know dollar terms or penny terms. Yeah, Mufasa uh, Shabazz said I had to dump Tezos. Yeah, I, I had to get rid of it. It just was, I got like, so for example, you can't win them all, right? You can't win them all. So basic attention token didn't perform well for me. Tezos didn't perform well for me. <clears throat> but Matic, um, Cosmos performed really well for me. VeChain performed, you know, it, it just great for me. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin did well for me. ETH did really well. Chainlink did well. The Graph token did well. So you 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 can't win them all. Um, what's the name? Didn't Hadera Hashgraph did okay for me, but um, Augur didn't do that well. I still have a bad, decent sized amount of Augur because I believe in the technology, but Augur didn't do well. But, yeah. It's up 120% for the year, but it didn't do well. I was expecting more from Augur. Yeah, I, it didn't do what didn't do well for me. Um, so I didn't lose any money. Like basic attention token at this point, it's just like eh. Even the Brave browser, I'm not a fan of using it. Zero X Zero X did well for me too. 
Um, I did I did well with zero wax. Where's zero wax at right now? Um, right here. Look, four hundred eighty four percent. So I did I did well in that. So for the most part, my bags pumped. I like Ren. Ren's one of my favorite projects. I'm I'm I, I purchased a little bit of it because I've been like dibbling, dabbling, like testing it out. So Ren's a good project. I've really been looking into Theta and uh, Zillica because that's what I'm going to review this weekend. I like Zillica. I like Zillica. I really like that project. Ontology is another one. That's another one that didn't do well. Um... I think I, I think I broke even. I have to go back and look at my Excel spreadsheet with ontology. No, actually ontology was airdropped to me. Yeah, ontology ontology was airdropped to me. And then I brought I brought a lot of it after I got an airdrop. I got an airdrop years ago of ontology in my um when I was using Binance. And then I believe I bought a lot of it after that. Um Curve is a curve is a good uh, a good project. It's for it's basically a dex for stable coins. That was the next thing I was going to teach in my DeFi course. I taught uh, I was teaching on Aave. Um, the next thing I was going to teach on was Curve, and how you can basically you know um, be a liquidity provider and earn Curve tokens. Basically, um, liquidity mining. That's what I was going to cover next. Curve is a solid project. Curve is a solid product. That was what I was going to teach next because I was going to get into, excuse me, yield farming and liquidity mining. But the gas fees are just, I'm not going to teach you guys things that you can't really use, right? It's pointless. The gas fees are just too high and I'm burning my ETH doing so. Like if you come here, you look at my wallet. I had like what, eight ETH in my wallet. I had about like 11 ETH in my wallet testing these product projects out. Over the past three months, I, I spent like almost like two, three grand on uh, testing out these DeFi products for the courses that I make for you guys. I said, hell no, that's that's wasting money. You know, like I'm wasting a lot of money to test these things out. I wouldn't say wasting money, but that's, I'm spending a lot of money. Um, so my, my, my kill zone for ETH, like if, if, if I wanted to add more to Ethereum is between 1500 and $1,100, right? That's my, that's my kill zone for Ethereum. 15 to $1,100 is my kill zone. That's why, that's why I'll look to add more for Ethereum. I told you we need, just look at these drops in crypto, right? Look at these drops in Bitcoin, right? Each drop was 30%. 40%, 50%. This is crypto. Crypto, it, it, it has these, these huge drops because, again, it's easy to manipulate the market. It's easy to push the market around. When you get these big drops, this is why you, this is where you dollar cost average at, right? This is where you have to be smart and know where you want to um, position yourself, right? So um, you want to make sure that you're sitting here. That's why I moved into stable coin. I moved it to a stable coin three days ago. And now I'm sitting here and I'm gonna get back in the market with projects that I like. So I'm gonna load up on lit. Um waiting for Moonbeam to come out. So start moving some money around. I'm looking at refinance. That's another one that I'm looking at. Um refinance. This is the project that I'm researching. I don't, you know. I think it's a scam. I'm going to be honest with you, but I'm looking at, I, I kind of want to pull a trigger on it. Razor. It's 44 cents right now. I, I think it's a scam. I've been looking at the team. I'm not really impressed. So, but, um, they're supposed to be working with, um, I believe Moonbeam. So they're an Oracle. I, I'm looking at them again. I, I haven't I haven't made my mind up. This is something I'm looking at yet. Right now, I'm leaning towards it to scam, but I'm asking around to see. This is something that look at it. It's, it the market cap's only sixteen million dollars, right? So it's ranked five hundred and forty nine. 
So this thing is like, I put a thousand bucks in it and treat it like a lottery ticket. Like this is something like, I'll be like, oh, I'm going to buy a thousand dollars worth and see if it could pump. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, cause a lot of you've been asking me like, oh, well, what projects do I like that's below $50 million in market cap? So I've been looking at some of them. This is one of them that I was looking at Razor Network. It's an Oracle. So I'm like, ah, I don't really know. But I mean, you can't, you, you can't go wrong with it. Um, Um, prediction for chain link easily over a hundred dollars. Easily. I'm, I'm bullish by far. I'm bullish. The, the, the most I'm bullish on this is in order. Chain link is number one. Like chain link is by far my number one cryptocurrency project right now, by far. Like I'll, I will add more to chain link at anything, anything below $20. I'll add more to chain link. Um, it's Chainlink, Ethereum, and then Polkadot. That's the order. So extremely bullish on Chainlink. Then we have Ethereum, then Polkadot. That's my order. Um, and then Bitcoin. But it's like, you know, Bitcoin's just up there right now. It's a trillion dollars. So in order for Bitcoin to double again, you need another trillion dollars to come in. But what's going to make Bitcoin pump a lot is that you're going to see like a lot of institutional investors get involved in Bitcoin in a major way. And you're going to see flow come from gold to Bitcoin. You're just going to see that. Uh, thoughts on DAI? DAI is a stable coin. But Chainlink is by far. Thank you for the donation and blessed. By far. When Once you understand, again, blockchains can only... A blockchain is a database. Very simple. And it's a block. And then it stores transactions from within that network in the block. But if you have a DAP, a decentralized application, and you want, you need sports scores, how are you going to get the sports scores into the blockchain? Right? If you had, if you had a sports betting app and you need sports scores, you need Chainlink because Chainlink is an oracle that can basically aggregate and get data from the real world, and then be able to feed it into the blockchain. That by far is powerful. Um. Setatoli says, uh, will Chainlink really hit $20 again? Yes. I, if we have a major crash, like think about it. ETH was just at $2,000. It's at $1,678. It hit $1,500 today. Right? So when, when, when we look at this, I believe we're going to get a 30% correction in Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin falls, remember, Bitcoin is pristine collateral. It's the, oh, it's the, the best of the best. So if Bitcoin's going to drop 30% from high to low, what do you think these altcoins are going to do? Some of them may drop 50 or 60%, right? So it's just the way that the markets, they, they function. So I mean, I'm expecting Link to get down to, you know, 25, 24, maybe even $20, um, 100%. Um, so... API three isn't an Oracle. It is a, um, a DAO. It is a decentralized autonomous organization. So it's like, it, it's to me, they're not really using a token to aggregate data. Like basically the way that link works is that you are a data provider and you're getting paid than the token, right? So if you provide good data, you get paid more link tokens because as a, as a data provider, you have to basically buy up a certain amount of link and stake them. And if you provide bad data, then you get slashed, you get penalized for providing bad data. If you provide good data, then you receive more of the link tokens, right? So the link token is used to facilitate the, basically the transferring of data. From my understanding of API three, you're really, you, you're not, the token is just used as a governance token. It's not necessarily used as um, basically rewarding people for providing data. So, I mean, it could perform well because it's an Oracle and people don't know any better, but I, it's not something that I would want to put my money behind. I looked into it. It's just not something I'm into. Uh, I'll give you some other good Oracles to look at. This is another one. I believe it's Teller. It's TRB, right? This is a good, this is a decent Oracle that I was looking at. I missed out on it. 
this is something that you can look at. Um, when it first came out, it got as high as $90, 90, uh, $90 um, all time. So spiked up to 60, no, it was, was it 62? This thing is right. Six, so the high is 60. I said 90, excuse me. So the, yeah, I was right. No, the all time high is $94.28. Yeah. So then it spiked up to 60 a few times. So this is one I've been looking at for a while. Um, just too volatile, but look at it. The market cap is only $63 million. So this is another one of those like far out there. If you wanted to speculate, uh, cause a lot of you asked me for something below 50 at one time it was below 50 million is close to it with this new crash. It could definitely drop there. This is something you may want to look at. Rich Hoff says, I tried to sell that today. No liquidity anywhere. You're talking about API three. Oh yeah, I, like I said, API three. Let's pull it up. Um, I looked into it. Like I said before, I'm just not. Um, it's not something that I'm. Uh, would want to put my money into. So. I looked into this project heavily. I just, I'm not that impressed in the project. Tell her. Yeah, tell her. Yeah, there's not a lot of liquidity. Think about it. It's, it's, it's only worth $63 million. It's ranked 300. So you got to be careful with those type of projects. You can get burned. Like if we go to one inch. So for example, let's pull this up. Um, so let's go here. Get rid of Jeff Booth. Um. So um like the fills on some of these these projects are horrible like for example um Razor You can see the liquidity that a lot of these projects, they don't have no liquidity. You can even see how they're going to, they, they'll route your order. Um, I, whenever y'all see like bars like this, like there's like no trades happening here. Like you see these bars, like there's absolutely nothing happening here. So like if you come in here and you buy something, you you can literally just pump the market. It says API three is the first party Oracle air node incentivizing the origin of the actual author of the information. Yeah, that's just a bunch of nothing. Yeah, you, L.A. Raman, you just basically said a bunch of nothing. It's basically a Dow. <laughs> this is why I try to say, you guys, you got to be careful who you listen to because this is the base is API is a first party Oracle air node incentivizing the origin of the actual author of the information. Yeah, that's a bunch of nothing. So, but like I said before, guys, it's crypto. It'll pump. I'm not telling you not to buy it. It'll pump. It's just not. I, from when I looked at it, I'm not interested in putting money in it. Um. Waiting on ETH to get in the fifteen hundred. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for ETH fifteen hundred to eleven hundred is my kill zone for ETH. Uh, Link sold for 
Yeah, Kraken had a flash crash. Um, John P. Kraken had a like, like so Kraken users are threatening a lawsuit over a flash crash. They had a flash crash. Right, it says on February 22nd, a flash crash on Kraken Exchange tanked Ethereum uh, to below $1,000. Like ETH hit as low as $700 on Kraken. Of course, I'm confident on ETH. I'm I'm hella confident on ETH. Yeah, I'm I'm not in Bitcoin anymore, um, Drunken Llama. Let's look at Dogecoin, right? Let's look at Doge. I haven't looked at Dogecoin in a while. Let's see what Doge is doing. Look at this. Ripple. Ripple's actually up today while everything else is down. Uh, Doge is 5.1%. Dogecoin. <laughs> Doge is dumb. Yes, Doge is dumb. You know how I feel about Doge. I, I wouldn't put any money into Dogecoin. It's a meme. It's a joke. But you have to understand the TikTokers, and 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 this is why you have you have to get the fact that everyone has access to information now, and people can pull into trades and gang up into trades. So you get you get into situations like this where everyone has Robin Hood and they just buy Dogecoin. Um, so set Anatoly, my thoughts on Uniswap, uh, Uniswap is, uh, it's a fork of balancer. I believe it was created by, um, Hayden Adams. And if, if you're in the Academy, right, I taught you how to use Uniswap inside of the, um, let's go to my YouTube channel, right? Matter of fact, right. So let's go here. Um, I taught you guys how to use Uniswap inside of the actual academy, and you got an airdrop, <laughs> right? So if you go back here and watch, like, I don't nail it every time. Sometimes I, I get it wrong, right? So right here, this is five months ago. I showed you guys how to get your Uni tokens, right? How to claim your Uniswap tokens. And if we go back five months ago, let's look at what Uniswap was trading at. If you would have held, remember I sold, um, I sold my uni tokens for ETH. So I made money at the time, but you would have made more money if you just held the uni token, right? So if we go back five months ago, the uni token was trading for about $5. So it got as high as 30. So, hmm. So you made about five and a half times on your money if you would have just held the token, right? So you got a free 1200 bucks. For those of you who are in the academy, many of you got that airdrop. Again, I'm not saying I'm, you know, it's because of me. It's because of Uniswap, but you learned about it because of me. And in the academy, I, t I gave you a list of 10 projects, I believe, that's going to airdrop next. Because also, if you're in the academy, you heard me talk about one inch. You should have got that one inch airdrop as well. But um, yeah, look at this. You gotta, you gotta basically if you would have held your uni from five, you made five and a half times on your money, right? So I, I sold my uni tokens for ETH. So let's see how much money I made from swapping to ETH. Let's see if it really was a big difference, right? So if we go to ETH five months ago, like I want to get as much ETH as possible. So ETH was at about $400 then. So yeah, so it's equivalent. Yeah, so ETH to uni is equivalent because this is about four, yeah, about four or five times on your money. So it's equivalent. So, so I, I cashed out, I cashed my uni for ETH, but if you look at the, it, you made five times your money if you held the uni tokens, you made five times if you cashed into ETH. So. Uh, 
Of course, Gino Ferragamo. That, that's why you should be smart. You should be dollar cost averaging right now if you want to get long. Um, I don't believe that you should be selling anything unless you cash it at the top and you're looking to get back in lower. Markets do not go straight up and they do not go straight down. I totally agree. If you're looking at a weekly chart, I believe Bitcoin, we could get down here to 44,000. 44,000, 38,000 Bitcoin. Have a good night, Darilla. Thank you for the donation. Um, Fantasy Hustlers, thank you for the donation. He says, don't indulge Doge. No, I just talk about Doge because I know a lot of you guys, you like Doge, right? So I talk about Doge. A red pill finance. I I could drop the coding boot camp tonight if I wanted to. It's basically done. It's just some things that I want to go over. And this time I want other people to look at it before I release it. When I put the first coding boot camp out, um, one thing about me, I listen to you guys. Like when you talk, I listen. So I learned how to, I didn't really focus a lot on HTML when I first learned how to code because I already knew HTML from back in MySpace days. Like if you had a MySpace page and you wanted to put like a heart or embed a video, like you had to know HTML. So I always knew HTML like from back in like high school. So when I put the, together the coding bootcamp, I wanted to hurry up and get the solidity. So I was mainly focusing on JavaScript. So I glossed over HTML and CSS, but many of you were struggling with the HTML and CSS portion. So now what I did is I went to the very, very basic and I covered all of the basic stuff with programming. I talked about what is the internet? Um, what is a web browser, a server versus a client? Um, you know, how your browser renders the HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Then I get into JavaScript. What is an anchor tag, an anchor element? What is, um, an image element, how to embed images, how to put a link in that, uh, H1, H2, H3, H4, H5 tags. Um, just getting into all of the basic thing. What's an attribute, what's a value, how to internally do CSS with the style element, how to externally link to a CSS file covering all of the basic things. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have like other people look it over before I release it so that therefore you guys don't have no excuse. I've put together cheat sheets, resources, PDS for you to download, um, and then go from there. So it's basically done. I just want to have some people review it so that I don't have to go through the same problem because a lot of you, you were saying I was going too fast. That's what happened with the last boot camp that we had, right? I was saying, oh my God, you know, this stuff is too fast. Cause I was mainly focusing on JavaScript because if you look at JavaScript and you look at solidity, solidity is very similar to the JavaScript programming language. And I was of the mindset that if we just build things, you would learn as we go. Cause that's how I learned how to program, right? I learned how to program by just building things. Um, and then you just pick up things as you go. But many of you, you, you want the basics. So I put together the basics. I'm talking about literally the basics, basics, um, and go from there. So, you know, for a lot of you that's, that's looking for that. I mean, if, if you don't, if you're tired of paying monthly, and you don't like what was already in there, you, you just have to wait. Or you can, you can always cancel and come back, you know. I, would, I won't hold that against you guys. Um, but that's what I'm focusing on doing. So this way now that when I release this, you have everything that you, you need. Because the way that I structure the course is we go HTML, CSS, then we cover the bootstrap framework, then we go into JavaScript, then we come back to CSS. We start talking about the flex box and the flex box grid and different designs. And then we go back into JavaScript. Then we get into APIs and databases. And then after that, we start talking about the command line. Then we're going to get into Git. Then we're going to start getting into um, MongoDB and also get into um, Node.js. Um, ETH is safer than Litecoin. Uh, IOTA is garbage. I wouldn't put any money in IOTA at all. 
to me, it's a permission blockchain. The whole idea is being permissionless, it's centralized. Hey, I love your channel. I got shaken out um, today the during the dump, wondering if you could provide insights as to where you think the market is headed in the next two days. Um, I have no idea where the market is going in the next two days. What I will say to you is that I believe the market's going lower over the next two weeks to a month. Um, how long that will take, maybe it could be over the next week, maybe it may take two weeks. But from high to low, I expect Bitcoin to pull back 30%. The altcoins, they're going to be more volatile. I mean, Bitcoin dropped 20% earlier today, right? So another 10, another 10 more percent in my prophecy would have been fulfilled. Um, so I, I see Bitcoin hitting 45,000, maybe 38 over the next two, two weeks to a month. I see ETH going between 1500 and 1100. And that's why I'll be looking to allocate more capital. Um, corrections are healthy. It's normal. Put things in proper perspective. Bitcoin's up 439% for the year. A 30% pullback is not the end of the world, right? When you're up 439%. ETH's up over 547. A 30% pullback's not that bad. So, and it was up even higher than that. Um, so that's what I, I look for. Um, right. So I, I, you know, that that's how I look at things. I, I, I don't I don't I don't get too, you know, wrapped up on um price. Overall, the trend is up. If you come here and you just look at the trend of Bitcoin, this is a weekly chart, the trend is up. Um, if you look at the day-to-day -day chart, we're above the Ichimoku cloud. Um, we definitely are going to probably, like I said, move sideways. That's healthy. You can see that this was a previous swing high to low. Then we broke above this, broke above this one. Nice momentum. This is about 42,000. So we can definitely see us pulling it back. I'm not a big proponent of technical analysis. But one thing about crypto, it tends to follow technicals because everyone else believes in it, right? So it becomes like a chicken versus the egg argument. Everyone believes in technical cool analysis, so therefore it is true. Um, so I could see us definitely pulling back to um, 42,000. I like to look at on-chain data. I have some tools that allow me to do that. So I get to see where a lot of buying and selling happened. At. And that's one of the beautiful things about crypto is that you can pull everything up on, you know, the block explorer and then that data can be aggregated. So you can see where people were buying at and where they were selling at. XLM is no different than Ripple. Ripple right now is going through that problem with centralization and being labeled to security. Um, I believe the founder and creator of Ripple is also now the founder of XLM. Uh, I'm not 100% sure about that. I'm probably about like 70% sure. Um, either he's the founder of XLM or the creator, or he's working over there right now. Um, same same problem that Ripple's having. It's just it's it's centralized at the end of the day. And when you look at Ripple, they try to sell you on the idea that you have Ripple Labs and you have XRP the token. But the reality is that all of the innovation happening around the XRP token is happening because of the XRP, the the Ripple Labs company, right? So the the ledger, the token, all of the technology that's being built. Right. The whole idea of something being opened and permissionless is that anyone can build and develop on it. So when I look at Ethereum, I look at Ethereum from the standpoint of when Aave is created, no one goes and sits down with Vitalik and say, hey, can I build Aave? People build it and they launch it. When you build synthetics, you're not asking Vitalik for permission to build on a blockchain. It's permissionless. When I look at Ripple, all of the partnerships and things that are being, you know, created and brokered, they're happening because of the Ripple Labs company. Now, when you read the SEC complaint, the problem with that is that they at Ripple Labs, 
they are a large owner. I believe they own 50% of the overall supply of the Ripple token. So they're going out and they're brokering deals. They're basically paying them below market to partner with them. So they go to, let's say, Bank ABC. And they say, you know, we're going to give you X amount of tokens at 25 cents, although Ripple is trading at 50 cents. So institutional investors are basically getting in at very low just to say, hey, we're partnering with them. Like they're not using the Ripple technology because they want to use Ripple. Ripple's paying them to use the, uh, the technology. That, that to me is problematic. No one's paying Michael Saylor to buy Bitcoin. No one's paying Elon Musk to buy Bitcoin. Elon Musk is buying Bitcoin because he wants to buy Bitcoin, right? Michael Saylor is buying Bitcoin because he wants to buy Bitcoin. There, there, there isn't someone, a spokesperson like a Brad Garlinghouse or Chris Larson going around and saying, hey, you know, you need to go and buy Bitcoin. Like, there's no CEO of Bitcoin. It's decentralized um, and it's permissionless. That's one of the key things. And then what's happening is that because they know that they're about to announce this new partnership, allegedly based upon the sec complaint they didn't pay the market makers to pump the price you the newbie you go and say oh my god they just partnered with this bank the price goes up and then brad garlinghouse and his wife they dumped the token on you right think about this if they believed in ripple so much why would they be selling billions of billions of dollars worth of xrp if they believed in a token right so it just becomes right it, it becomes problematic when you just look at the way the incentives is structured so um, I believe XLM is no different when you when you look at the structure of XLM. Now, again, I want to preference my statements. Just because I don't like a project doesn't mean it can't pump. I believe Ripple is going to zero. I, I, I hate Ripple. I think it's absolute garbage and useless. But um, like XLM could pump because we're so early in the cycle. And when you when you're talking about fiat currencies and you're talking about stimulus and you're talking about bailouts, that money has to go somewhere. Um, so when when you understand that there's so much liquidity in the markets, these things can pump. What's two billion dollars when the Fed's injecting a trillion here, a trillion there? Over the long run, I believe that the cream of the crop will rise to the top and the solid projects are the best things to invest in. And when the market begins to tank. The garbage will tank first. So this is why I'm a, I'm a huge believer in investing in solid projects that have working main nets and they have solid teams and they have utility. Like Synthetics is a project that has utility. Loop Ring is a project that has utility. It has a working product. Ave, Maker, those are real products, Uniswap, that people want to use and it has product market fit. Um, those things matter. Like watching what happened with GameStop and Robinhood, that couldn't happen with Uniswap, right? So that there's a need in the marketplace for that. Love Cosmos. Um, I said my 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 prediction for ETH is five thousand dollars at least. Five thousand dollars ETH at the end of the year. That's my prediction for ETH. Uh, five thousand dollars ETH link hundred dollars and better. That's my prediction for Link and ETH. My uh, Link is by far my favorite project. Then it's Ethereum. Then it's Polkadot. Mm -mm -mm. Um, Nash, come on to come to the academy. Join the academy. I I show you all of that stuff. Gino, you're bullish. You said twelve thousand dollars. Damn, I said five. You bullish twelve. <laughs> it says, what about Litecoin? They're going to have a partnership with Cardano. I, I don't listen to me. I, I don't love Litecoin. I hate it. I, I just think it's like. The, to me, the, the, there's not enough innovation happening with, with, with that project. Like, it's just not not fast enough. Like when, when you look at DeFi, you just look at the amount of tooling and just the mind share that's pouring into this space. I You look at Litecoin, it's just like it's there. It's nothing exciting about Litecoin. It's just not, there's nothing exciting about it.
um you can try the academy out we have a we have a free um three-day trial so you could just try it out and see if you like it if you like it you can stick around if not it keeps saying seven the thing is cached so i have to definitely clear my cache But guys, we're coming up on um, two hours and 19 minutes. So I'm definitely going to end it here. I've been talking for a very, very long time. So uh, just keep this in mind. Pullbacks are healthy. Bitcoin has had multiple crashes of 50%, 60%, 80%. You can definitely go just type in Bitcoin crashes. You can pull up this list and see this. This is healthy. This is normal. This isn't a crash, but I'm just showing you the multiple crashes has had of 30 percent um just keep these things in mind be rational don't over leverage yourself i always believe in dollar cost averaging so you know allocate a small amount of money over time so if i had ten thousand dollars to invest invest a thousand dollars every two weeks or you know every month and just have it set on um you know auto invest that way you're never over leveraging yourself uh, and just be smart focus on solid projects so you can structure your portfolio where, you know, you go 30%, 40% Bitcoin, and then the rest can go into altcoins. However you want to structure it, you can structure your portfolio. But just understand that this Yeah, that's, think about it. My my mixer went out on me because I've been talking for so long. Um, I've been on for, for two hours. So um, let's see, is the sound back? Is it back now? Yeah, so... I've been streaming for so long that my um, mixer went out. Um, what I was saying is that I, I don't care which uh, smart contract platform you believe in, whether it's Polkadot, Cardano, or Ethereum. I believe that whoever wins the smart contract application platform, they're definitely going to flip Bitcoin and become number one because Bitcoin is just a store of value and currency. And that's it, right? And that's one use case but f the world of finance is so much bigger than just currency store of value and when you start thinking about lending derivatives borrowing on the blockchain capital markets on a blockchain insurance real estate on top of the blockchain all of those things are possible with smart contracts and application platforms and now we're talking about you know multi-trillion dollar assets so i truly believe that whoever wins that that ecosystem and that network effect will definitely uh, dominate and make a lot of money. So um, right now, Ethereum has the first mover's advantage, but we know that the fees are extremely high. Maybe Cardano could make a push and win. We don't know. That's the beautiful thing. But as of right now, Ethereum has proven that there is need and utility for decentralization within the um, DeFi space. So... It's exciting to be around. Just make sure that you're being smart and you're not over leveraging yourself and you're taking that time out to do the due diligence that you need. Um, I believe that the future will either be centralized or decentralized. 
we have a choice. It's really up to you. So um, if you're interested in joining my community or learning more about the technology, a link in the description below it will be there for you to join my academy. Uh, feel free to also join my mailing list so that you can be notified via email when I go live. And please like the video, share the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Uh, thank you to everyone that donated. I just saw a donation come through. Um, I want to address this. What's your end of year prediction for GRT? Love your content, by the way. Thanks. No problem, FNS. Uh, GRT between a three to five billion dollar market cap. It already hit a three billion dollar market cap almost. Um, GRT, where is it at? GRT, GRT, right here. It's a dollar seventy. Look at this. Oh man, I'm gonna buy some. I'm scooping up some GRT right now. I'm definitely going to start buying some um, as soon as I hop off of here. So um, it hit right above below uh, $3. I believe the high for GRT. Let's go here. Definitely about to buy some right now. It got up to $2.83. So I was predicting about a 3 to $5 billion valuation. And it got up to $3. So right between 3 to $5 is the range for as far as price. Um, I'm about to definitely jump in there right now. This is easy money. Start dollar cost averaging. Uh, where did it break out of a dollar? Yep. So I'll start averaging from a dollar seventy six. Definitely gonna hop in there. So yeah, that that takes care of everything. Oh guys, I've been running my mouth all day. Um, I'm gonna leave it here. Uh, thank you again too for the donation. I appreciate it. I hope I answered your question. And uh, have a good night, guys. <laughs> I've been talking too much. Bye.